Good morning. I'm Holly Magnuson, and I'm here with Sean Corman for Ask the Security Guy. Good morning, Sean. Good morning. How are you? Uh, doing all right. A little tired, but you know we'll make it. Uh, for those of you who are joining us, uh, this is a time today for you to ask your questions about security issues, um, identity theft. What what's on the table, Sean, that they could ask? So today was meant to be just a general Q and A. There's a lot going on in the world as always. Um, but we wanted to take a time and just set aside for our users questions and answers. Now, uh, I want to preface this by saying, you know, if there's a point at which today I can't answer the question uh, during the show, uh, I will put it either in the show, show notes afterwards or I'll contact you directly. So, but is there anything off the table that we can ask? Oh, I don't know. I, <laughs> there was an article you had shared earlier that was... Uh, <laughs> Kind of interesting. Yeah, I do want to talk about that one from the standpoint of how much information do the bad guys really need to be um, dangerous? And well, are you going to really air this dirty laundry? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, last week, I, I read an article that um, the Hanes online store had a breach. And it was something like 900,000 um customer, online customers files were um, compromised. And with that, they got um, names, addresses, email addresses, and the last four digits of the credit card. Mm -hmm. And one customer received the letter from Haynes. They contacted the customer service and was told, oh, you don't need to worry. They only got the last four digits of your social security number. Your, or, sorry, not social security, your credit card. Right. Well, the, this customer was a little concerned, so um, he or she called their credit card company and explained what happened, and the credit card company immediately says, you know what, we will send you a new card because there is things to worry about. And I have a theory, but why don't you share with us, Sean, um, why, you know, why is it dangerous if they have just my last four digits of my credit card? Well, it's actually the combination of data that we're looking at. Um, so when we, for instance, when we talk about, uh, there's an acronym we use a lot called P2Data, or PII. And what that stands for is personally identifiable information. The idea there is that most people in a security context, when they think about P2Data, we talk about name and social security number. And that's really the holy grail, because that uniquely identifies a person like that. But there's other ways to make P2 data. It's something that, remember, it's a combination of data that can uniquely identify a person. So if you've got John Smith in the United States, chances are there are a lot of John Smiths in the United States. But if we narrow it down to a state, that's fewer. If we narrow it down to a city or a town, that's much fewer. But if we have a street address, chances are we're talking about that one John Smith. So that's why P2 data and combinations of data can be really dangerous in the hands of bad guys. When we talk about the last four of a credit card number, the problem there isn't so much that they'll use the card, it's that they'll be able to use the password reset customer service tool for verification and that they, they can then take over an account. So some of the online stores, if you call their customer service and say, I forgot my password, and you have a credit card stored with them on, you know, on file with them, one of the things they'll ask you in order to reset your password is the last four of your credit card number. If you have that and you give it to them, they'll reset your password and poof, you're in. And then you can make charges against the card on that store. So Amazon and Apple actually had that problem a couple years ago, and there was a, a, a well-known uh, author who had first his Twitter account compromised through that mechanism, and then they got into his whole iTunes account that way. And they took over his iPad, his laptop, and they ultimately wound up costing him several thousands of dollars because they deleted his stuff. And he had all of his family pictures on there. And he wanted them back, so he paid for a data recovery service. He didn't get everything back, but he did get most of it. But, you know, they were pictures of his babies, you know, and those kinds of things. So 
But that was how you know a very straightforward, what was meant to be a good customer service tool was twisted with those with the last four of the credit card number to gain access. Yeah, um, you know, and my thinking was as far as using that information, if I've got, you know, I can set up a nice little phishing uh, routine and I can email these folks and I can show them how much I know about them. So I have to be legitimate. But we had a problem and, you know, we need the rest of your credit card number and the security code on the back and your expiration date, you know. I, and sadly, I think I would probably get rich until, you know, the Fed showed up at my door and took me away. But, um, that's where I could see this information being very useful in the wrong hands. Well, and, and you're exactly right. When we talk about phishing campaigns, the more legitimate it looks, the better. And the guys who craft these emails that go out oftentimes will pull what, whatever's current on the, the company they're targeting, say it's Chase Bank or Bank of America or even Google. So they'll pull in the logo and the icons and the text font and the, the color schemes and all of it to give it an air of legitimacy. Now, when you add in the additional information, as you described, you know, this is what I know about you already. You're right. A lot of people will say, oh, well, that yeah. looks legit. Let me click on the link. And it, it's really, it behooves us, at, you know, on all of these points to be suspicious. Yeah. Well, and this just past weekend, I forwarded it over to you. I got this very lovely email from Chase warning yes. me of illegal um, activity on my, my account. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, you know, he didn't use um, the, any of the Chase logos, but it was a well-written email until you got to the link to click on, and he kind of blew it there. Yeah, um, he blew it actually by sending one to me in the first place. But you know, up until that point, it was looking pretty good. And it was interesting because I did a little research on that email you sent over, Holly. And you're right; the the grammar was perfect. I mean, it was very professionally written. It had a good look and feel. Um, but the link was a dead giveaway. I mean, yeah. it was it wrapped around three times on my page. <laughs> yep, three and a half lines. And then when I started to check it out, the domain was, uh, what was it, chasesupport.gq, and it was registered with Freenom in Brazil. And so, you know, it, once you start going down the rabbit trail, it, it gets pretty ugly pretty quick. Um, but what was interesting was the website had already been taken down. Yeah. And we're, what we're, one of the things we're seeing is um, these, these spammers are putting up websites on the free hosting tools like Weebly, or HostGator or GoDaddy have free website builders if you register a domain. And they'll put up a page and they'll call it. Um, I've seen some that even target our, the IMT support desk. They're supposed to mimic us. And you go there and it, they've pulled in our color schemes and some of our logos and icons and they've created this fake page. And it's, it's a pretty simple process of dealing with it. But one of the things I've noticed is the hosting companies are getting much better at taking them down quickly. And they all have abuse reporting mechanisms now that are very effective. So when we see them, we, we, you know, we report them immediately. And we're seeing same day response in a lot of cases. Yeah, I was, and I was impressed, you know, I forwarded, I logged into my Chase account, not through their link, but into my actual Chase account and found the, the email address that Chase had for um, reporting abuse. And I guess abuse at chase.com. And I forwarded the email, I got an automated response immediately with some really great, you know, just the tips that we talk about every, all the time on, you know, if you did click on anything, change your password. Actually, they said if you click on it, call us immediately. And here's right. the 800 number. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was really very effective. Yep. And, you know, we're, there's a lot of great work being done, not only in the preventative side, which is helping educate people on how to spot this stuff, but on the remediation side where, okay, you did click on it. Here's the, the short list of things you can do right now to protect yourself. And organizations are getting much better at getting that information into the hands of those who are affected. Yeah. Um, 
So we do have a question that just popped in. For those of you who are watching who may not know, um, you should see the Q&A app over on the right-hand side of your screen that you can submit a question. And we have a question from Aubrey. So you ready for it? Okay, bring it. What action would you recommend when you come across a company where when you call, you call to do something with your account, they want you to verify your address and the last four of your Social Security by reading them to you? So they already have the information on file and they're reading it to you? Is that the question? Let's see. When you, let's see. When you call to do something with your account, they have you verify your address and last four of your social by reading them to you. So yes, they are giving you um, their last, you know, telling you what your last four digits in social or of your social and your address are. So I'm reading this here. that's actually not a bad practice in concept. Um, I, I'm not real thrilled with the idea that they're actually reading it to me, though, because if I was calling that company, if I was aware of their of that there was that that was their practice, that'd be a great way to do some collecting. Because all I need then is a list of names, and I'll use them to collect last four social. And just call back repeatedly. Interesting, yeah. Um, so it it isn't an end game in and of itself, but man, they've created a great data collection point. Um, you know, from a customer service standpoint, again, I, you, I understand they're they're trying to provide a simple, effective customer service tool, and that's often the the case. The downside is, you know, convenience and security are always at odds. So we always try to find that balance, and it's hard, you know, and people will make choices based on what they think is safe. Um, but overall, I'm not, I'm not real thrilled with the idea of them reading my stuff back to me. Yeah, I would, yeah, I got excited about that. <laughs> but... But in some situations, you have to do business with them. I'm not sure how you work around that. Um, there are feedback mechanisms almost every company has. Yeah. And you can write them a letter and say, hey, you know, I really don't like this, or this is why I think what you're doing is an issue, and give them feedback. Otherwise, they're operating in a vacuum. Yeah, my, my one of my vendors who... Um, you know, had, I've had account, an account with for years up until their new version came out. All their passwords were in clear text. Drove me crazy. We drove right. you crazy too. Yes. Uh, that's why I never use that password on anything else. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I know. I know my. Yeah. You know. But they've just recently updated their product where it's now encrypted. They can't. It's not clear text anymore. And most of their customers have been angry with them because their customers like to call them and say, hey, I forgot my password. Can you tell me what it is? Right. And right. I, you know, and I told you know, my rep, I said, no, you're doing them a favor. It's, yeah. <laughs> they need to do, you know, so. And it, and it does make people angry sometimes. And really, at the end of the day, it's protecting our customers. It's protecting our users. And so is it inconvenient? Yes. But it's really, it's a protection mechanism in place for them and us. Yes. Um, Want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the question that Brian from here in um, IMT sent over to us um, about a recent um, vulnerability in Mac OS 10. Um, mm -hmm. Sean, I know you didn't have a lot of time to look into that, but you know, can you talk to it a little bit? So, in just scanning the article really quickly, um, what it is is a zero day where an attacker can basically gain full control of a Mac without, a, without the need for a password. And um, what it really illustrates, I mean, it, it illustrates a couple things. One, Apple knew about this for a while, and they are not being overly ambitious at patching the vulnerability. Um, that is true, for, unfortunately, for both Microsoft and Apple. I don't want to single out Apple here. Um, but for, for these large organizations, being able to respond quickly to things like this seems to be a problem. Um, the other side of the coin, too, is it really illustrates a long-standing fallacy with Apple in that people believe that Apple products are 
hacker proof or that they don't need antivirus or they're safe and there's not malware out there for Macs. The amount of attention that the black hat community has paid attention to Apple is pretty much in direct correlation with Apple's market share. For, for, many, for a very long time, you know, Microsoft dominated the market in terms of number of desktops and laptops out there. Well, Apple is changing that and they're taking more and more and more of a foothold in the marketplace and more of their devices are present. Along with that, they're getting more and more attention from the underground community as well. And the underground community is highlighting, as they are known to do, all of the vulnerabilities that Apple has, which we all, you know, those of us in the security community knew they existed, but because there was, wasn't a lot of attention being paid to it, we never really got a lot of traction in calling it out. Now we're seeing, and this zero day is a great, you know, a great point. Nothing's safe. If it's technology based, it's not safe. You can't just infer that one manufacturer over another, or one software distribution over another is safe just because of who they are. If, if somebody's writing millions of lines of code, there's going to be mistakes in there. There's going to be errors made. And those will eventually be found and exploited. And this is a perfect example of that. Yeah, so exactly. It, yeah, you, we just, you just can't take you know, the security of a device for, for granted. Whether it's a Mac or a Windows PC or an Android or whatever flavor it is. You always use good security practices regardless of what device you're using. Yeah, it's still, we are still smarter than the machine. And yes. we still have to use that you know, common sense. And, you know, no matter how cool that little application looks like, really, you know, take a look, good long look before you download it for free because they're seldom free. Well, free is never free. There's always a cost whether it's your privacy, your information, or something. You're, you're paying for it somehow. So. As I'm not seeing any other questions pop up, so I have another one. From, okay. you know, from just, you know, with my son going back to school, uh -huh. and, you know, his high school has opened up, you know, a web store. So, okay. that, you know, I could have gone on last night and um, paid for his ASB card and his yearbook and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I sit there with it up on my screen and I just couldn't put in my credit card information. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't go there. So um, is there advice, things that we can look at when we are, um, you know, shopping like that and have this type of situation, you know, to help us have peace of mind or know when to run? So there's a couple things you can do. Um, with school districts in particular, they are typically outsourcing these web stores to uh, fairly reputable companies in most cases um, who do the hosting, who are verified with the payment card industry as being secure, that have good practices for handling the credit card data. Um, in most cases, the school district never actually sees the payment information. They just receive it through their processor, which is what you want. You, you don't want a school district actually processing your payment. You want a third party who does that for a living. Um, so, you know, for, from that perspective, I wouldn't be overly leery of it. I, I It's still, well, because it's me, it makes my skin crawl, but... Uh, and one of the one of the the most effective ways I have is when you're dealing with a site like that, where it's really the one stop shop where you have to go to buy something, where it's not available anywhere else. And you look at the thing, and it it kind of makes you the red flags are popping up in the back of your head. Um, one of the things I recommend people is keep a very low limit credit card um, around just for that purpose. You know, $300 credit line, something like that. And then when you have those sketchy sites that you're just not so sure about, not sure. use that card. And then, you know, when you're done, pay it off. Um, that way, the risk to you is very low. 
because if the card data is actually compromised, it's a low limit card and you can work with a credit card company on the fraudulent charges and they'll most, most cases just wipe it without a second thought. But it reduces risk is really what you're after. So you know you have to go there to buy this thing, whatever that thing is. But you don't want to use the debit card that's tied to your main bank account. Use something safer. Yeah. And that's and that and that's good advice. Whether it's back to school or you know Christmas is just around the corner, right? And well, you know many of us like to shop online. So, mm -hmm. well anymore, that's how I do my Christmas shopping. I, I just I hate going into stores. <laughs> I can't blame you, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so um, I don't know if there's any other questions. If you do, go ahead and pop those on. I need to hop over here and look. I was getting a message from someone who was having some problems getting in. I'm not sure if Frank got in. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't respond. So, um, right. well, I do have one other, you know, Thing that um, I don't think I ever had a chance to tell you about a local school district at the end of um, la yeah, last spring, the school year ended and everything. And about a week or so after school ended, they realized that someone had hacked into the parent student portal oh. where all the grades were um, kept yeah. and uh, they changed grades. Some people, they gave a higher grade. Some people, they went in and gave them lower grades. Um, and I, unfortunately, was not able to get all the information. You know, the, the term I heard is they hacked in. Um, I know that system and how well they do the passwords. They didn't, you know, at that time, didn't really force any criteria. Right. As a parent, what do we want to think about with our kids' information in the schools? You know, it, it's a tough thing um, when we're dealing with our kids' information in school districts. School districts are typically under the gun. Um, the grade system is usually run locally in-house. And This is through a, a third-party system that several districts in this area use. Uh, okay, but it's managed and controlled by the district. I'm not 100% sure, yeah. Yeah, most likely. So password security was um, either not enforced or not even set up, I guess. Um, but really, there's not a lot we can do on the school side. You know, uh, the schools are really under the gun. They're also a prime target for identity theft because, you know, like a university, you know, they have large amounts of personal information about kids. So that includes social security numbers, which, you know, for identity theft is key. On the security.apu.edu website, we talk about um, credit freezes. And one of the things we can do as parents is put credit freezes on our kids um, so that if somebody does get a hold of their information, they won't be able to do much with it, at least in terms of buying anything. So, and because most identity theft is has a financial root as you know, the ultimate purpose. If we can put a credit freeze on our, our kids' socials, that's a great start. That's a good preventative measure. And again, you know, that information is on support.ap or not support security.apu.edu though there you would find a link to um, the security website from support.apu.edu. Um, we you know, we want you to be able to find us and get um, get our information. All righty. So do we have any other questions, Holly? Uh, not yet. Nothing's popped up. We'll give them a moment or two because there is a slight lag between when you, what you and I are talking about and when they hear it on the, on the other uh, side. Yeah. So yeah. we'll give them just a couple of minutes here for um, last-minute questions. And if not, then I don't think I have any more. Okay. I've had several today. <laughs> well, hopefully our, our users resonate with what you were asking. Hopefully so. So no questions are popping up. Um, if you do have a question later on, always feel free. You can email iso at apu.edu. Mm -hmm. um, Sean and I both see those emails and you know we will get back. One of us will get back to you um, as soon as we can with answering your questions and stuff. So 
And if you see interesting spam emails come into your inbox, uh, send them to spam at apu.edu. Um, I will see those as well as the support desk, and we, we love getting new and interesting examples. Yes. Um, the, the, it's, it's kind of nice to see creativity in our spammers and fishers. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, Brian just jumped in and was able to get in. And yes, Brian, um, he did talk about your OS question to a point. Um, so sorry you're just getting here. He's been working hard, I'm sure. Brian will actually, in October, he will be taking my place because I will be out of town. So you guys will get to meet Brian. Mm -hmm. He um, also has a, a passion, I think, for security stuff. He does. He's, he's always, um, he's finding stuff and bringing it to Sean as far as the security. And he's been a great asset to our, to our team. We're very happy to have him on the team. So any other questions? Going once. Going twice. Sold. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll be back again next month. I haven't looked I, the date for the first Wednesday in September, um, but we'll be the back to school and um, and talk about um, what's happening in this world of security at that point. All right. Well, hopefully it's not as hot as the weather. It's definitely. <laughs> so have a great day. Again, email us at iso at apu.edu. Check out security.apu.edu, and we'll see you later. All right. Sounds good. Bye.